Hello and welcome to another exciting Volvo Rescue restoration series. This is a 1967 Volvo Amazon wagon called Genevieve. If you missed the video where we picked up Genevieve, be sure to check out the link below in the description. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the best seven and a half minutes that you're going to spend on the internet tonight. I'm pulling off the door panel on Genevieve here. We're going to start dissecting the car one door, one panel at a time. And I've already covered how to remove the handles and the panel and the windows and everything in prior videos. I'm going to touch on a few things that are different for this car. I will link the prior video in the description so that you can have an idea of how to remove those parts if you haven't done so before. Okay. In here, uh, something worth noting that I didn't notice on Arthur, the butyl putty goes on top of the screws that are here for the little triangle vent window. And it's another step that they take in weatherproofing this car. And so I need to take note, careful note of that, because in a rainy cl climate, blah, blah, like Southern California, you want to make sure you have a pretty watertight car and that all the drains, especially those down in the bottom of the doors, you want to make sure those drains are open, which would be... Um, down in here past the dirt so that's good we're also going to clean up these edges here so that nobody cuts themselves and gets tetanus and when we replace this panel we will not have duct tape we're going to actually use a proper plastic sheet like it did on Arthur to make sure that we're waterproofing the car these are the remnants of the staples that are resting on the panel there and uh, it was holding up all right really good spot for the speaker too we'll see what we want to do with that and cable um, cable adjustments there for the window which is on a chain I'm gonna continue pulling it out and if if something pops out at me I will be sure to show you guys so stay tuned go back to your audiobooks after you've pulled out the left rail uh, disconnect the left rail with the screw down in here of course and then disconnect the right rail which is two outside screws and they're gonna be offset like that pull that out then you can pull out the top one here the top one there tuck the window as you've disconnected it from the cable behind the little metal and there should be a bump stop bu rubber bumper right here in that hole. Drop that window down. That will give you the space to move this corner window out after you've taken out the screws along the edge here and the two down here. This rubber triangle will be the first to come out. That'll give you a little bit more wiggle room to then pull the rest of the window out in that way and then the glass will come up and out. Pretty cool. I wish I could uh, it'd be a lot of fun to actually just make a big piece of glass that then fits all into here and then seals up nicely. That would be a lot of fun. I'd like to see that. But this is it. Vintage appeal and it sticks OEM and it's worked fine for many, many years. And I actually really like this rubber bumper design. Whoop, 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 whoop. All right. This is the box of all of our front parts. This trim piece was a pain in the butt to remove and I'm going to see if I can tackle it. Uh, a better way this time around. We're gonna we're gonna look into that before we decide to undertake that. All right, time to remove these guys because we are sandblasting. Also, quite a bit of butyl putty in these holes here that hold the handle, the big black one. I figured it out. EA. This this trim piece, you know the the really frustrating one. It just slides over and pops on. And oh my goodness, I would have saved myself so much trouble. So much trouble. Yeah, from the back, you see that guy? And it just tucks along the edge and you pop it out. Here's your little turtle clips. Wow, big surprise. And it just comes out. Get out of here. Oh, my Lanta. Okay, now I know. Okay. I'm so sorry. Genevieve is a 67 Volvo Amazon and she's Jack's car. This is going to be the third Volvo Amazon wagon I've pulled apart and the first one that I'm going to be putting back together, which is kind of funny. You remember Shelby 1 and 2? Those were, they're now kind of in a slow spot. I've got pretty cool plans for Shelby 1 that I'll tell you about later as we get closer to summer. And then Shelby 2, of course, is just sandblasted and waiting for the budget to come through. But this car will be sandblasted this weekend, and we're going to have regular video updates as we restore it 100% to original quality. have all the doors finished and pulled apart here in the back seat. I'm also starting up on the headliner, which has been pretty easy once you bend those bows 
a little open out of the way and then untuck the headliner. That's one way to preserve it. The one thing I noticed was that there's a the butyl putty is right here on these joints, uh, taking up this empty space and that empty space there as well to allow water to drain from the gutter here. And instead of having the option of going into the cabin and then into the carpet, it will further push it out that way. So that's another spot I need to keep in mind to help keep water out of the car. A really big point in this car, of course, is waterproofing it and making sure we have all the adequate draining. Removing the hatch on these wagons, pretty simple. Once you get the headliner out, you have access to those bolts that are gonna be holding the hinges up on the inside. There's two on either side. Wiggle everything out. Take note of where the butyl putty is, where the rubber gaskets are, and any potential rust holes that you might have. This is actually the one of the few places that we did have rust was up on the top hinge areas. Not bad at all, and when we sandblast, we'll have an idea of what we're working with. Another spot where there's a little bit of waterproofing is going to be the hinges here. Right around them is a butyl putty, and as they slide into the bottom of the hatch area, it's going to be a nice spot where water can collect. This tray, this entire tray, is a great candidate for rust, so you want to make sure that the drains are clear on that, as well as the bottom corners of the lights. There's a couple rubber plugs, but you also want to make sure that your drains up in the corner are clean. Just in case I forget which way this goes, this is up, and this is the bottom side. Because once they're sandblasted, I won't really be able to tell. So there's a slight curvature down. This is the bottom. This is the top. Those orange spots there are glue that was holding the foam down. It looks like rust, which is kind of funny. But overall, pretty simple. Easy removal of all the mechanisms that hold the doors and the hatch together. Today's a costume parade. Only time you're gonna get to see me with a mustache because I have to shave it off. Sad day, but it's fun. Wearing tights underneath. Tickets are on sale now. We open on the 11th. It's Kiss Me Kate, one of the best Cole Porter musicals you'll ever see. Be sure to visit unmtickets.com for more information. <laughs> Did I forget to mention? It's hilarious. Okay, here we've removed the headlights, the grill, a lot of the front trim pieces. We're getting ready to pull the engine. But I wanted to show you a high stress point in the frame that usually cracks like on Bruce and how Volvo has fixed the problem themselves in the later years of the Amazons. That corner where things like to crack and break, you can see that it's been reinforced on this car already. It was a thing done by the factory. On later years, of course. On older years, you have to make a welded you have to weld your own plate in place of that. And then if you look on the inside of the fenders, you can see a little bit more of a box design around it. Pretty sturdy stuff compared to the old ones that would always just flex and break. Another day, another task. I've got the bumper off. That was so easy. Something about these California cars, just everything's coming off very smoothly. I like that a lot. So there's the four 19 millimeter bolts holding those brackets. Lower that bumper. Convenient disconnection on those Marshall lights. They uh, just have the positive negative cables that unplug here like that. I got the engine disconnected in the back where the transmission's at. I've got the exhaust pulled down. There's the three bolts, the B20 manifold. I had the other one and I sold it. Is actually a really good upgrade. So if you have a B18, just get a B20 exhaust manifold. It's got two ports on it. And under here, these Makuni carbs, the choke is a really weird two cable design. It's not weird because there's two, there's two uh, carburetors, but you, they just seem very sealed in there. I'm not gonna pull those apart to disconnect the choke over there. So I'm gonna pull the cable over here. However, it just looks like a big mess of winding up those uh, choke cables there. And then they had them screwed in here and anchored down. And it's really bizarre, so hopefully I'll be able to get the adjustment right on there so that we're not over-tightening when we uh, pull the choke out to adjust it here inside the car. Otherwise, pretty straightforward. Steering wheel puller will be here later today. I'll be able to get that steering wheel out, and once the steering wheel is out, everything on the dash can come out 
I was looking at Shelby 2 down the street and Shelby 1 as well. They're all automatic cars and automatics have that extra cutout here for the gear shift selector and then they had a different collar on the steering wheel as well as the little prindle switch as I like to call it. So should be pretty good. We're almost at the end of this pulling apart. In a couple of days this car is going to be out of here and it's going to be at the shop getting sandblasted. Exciting times I know. Removing an old windshield without breaking it is a really big task, but the easiest thing to do is just take your time, be diligent, and have a lot of sharp blades available. Let's go take a look at the rest around the windowsill here. This is a compound that was used. It's a hard plastic stuff that was used to keep the windshield sealed. And you can see that it worked in most places. Um, water still got in though, because quite a bit of rust. It's a it's a bit bubbly. All the wet stuff right here is WD-40. That's what I was using to help lubricate my tools as I was running them back and forth. So, not much of a surface left to. Well, not much to worry about, but there's still enough surface left to get a gasket on here and seal it up really well. Um, not sure exactly if the weak spot is water pooling on the inside of the glass on the corners and then getting through the gasket into the bottom here, or if it's just coming up from the top somewhere, which... It's... I'm going to have to look into how they get a perfect seal on these because of what I've discovered is that they all leak and they all have that issue. Oh, this is local. The local guy. The local guy. This is all local. Local. local guy. I'm just gonna do whatever I want. Would you like a bag of potpourri? I'm sorry. Focus. Shout out to Jose. B20 engines had an accessory option for air conditioning, so that is a perfect spot to put your bolt for hoisting the engine. And of course on the other side, I'm going to end up using the exhaust manifold bolt as usual. 3 8 by 16 is the thread pitch on that bolt. The real trick to getting these engines out is that you want the front tilted up a lot and then the back drops quite a bit too. That's one way you can clear the back side of the firewall where the heater hoses go and then that's another good way to clear the sump on the oil pan. Of course you have to remove that upper piece that runs along the top of the radiator support which will give you the room to move the engine out towards it. I love how simple these old B18 and B20 engines are. A couple bolts on the exhaust, two motor mounts, and the drive shaft. The shifter, that's about it. Choke cables, maybe some heater hoses. Pretty simple overall.
This engine is a B20E. It had a fuel injection head that was capped, and so it's got a higher compression head, larger exhaust valves. I believe it's two millimeters bigger or something like that. And we're going to repaint it and reseal it, but it does not need a rebuild. It's got Makuni carbs, and they're awesome. Removing the dashboard's pretty simple. You start by taking the wheel out, and everything else follows suit. This is a $20 puller that you can rent at any auto zone, or maybe some other auto parts stores around have it. Be sure to take careful notice of which wires go where. There's a many different ways to document things. I just did a video documentation, so I would go through and say what wires go to what connection, taking pictures. You can use electrical tape, which is also good, but if you're pulling everything out through the firewall, you could rip a lot of your tape, and it wouldn't really help you in the end. This is the piece you want if you want your little turn signal to reset itself. Turn signal's on. You're turning the wheel left. It'll keep it, it'll keep it, and then you turn to the right, reset. Let's go right. We'll turn signal right, turn the wheel to the right, keeps it, when it comes time to reset, boom. Beautiful. All that in a nylon ring. And this ring has a little niche in it where it attaches right there on the back of the steering wheel. It looks like a big mess, and it is. It's pretty intimidating, especially with all the wires that don't make sense and how they're routed out through the back there. But it's not my first rodeo, so I'm pretty confident in what I'm doing. Okay, here's the part where we mark the back side of this to make sure that we have exactly the wires that we need and the places they need to go later. Years of coughing and sneezing have made this chrome pretty dirty, pretty ugly. We're going to make sure that we clean it up. This burn crunchy thing was the door speaker. That faded red wire from the ignition coil, it's going to go to that relay, which is the overdrive relay. Could be one of the most frustrating but most rewarding parts you know once you get it all put back together it can be a lot of fun knowing that you made sense out of this i fed the wires through the firewall the last thing to come through was that bulk connector here which is the one that connects the tail lights um, and the reverse you know everything in the back there so that was the last one there. the last stop making noise that was the last one to go through the wall we have a hole that's about an inch and a half in diameter, so not a lot to work with there. But we managed to get all of this through it. And I took video labels of everything as best as I could. Now the disconnecting of the following bits is going to be here under the hood. And we are close to that harness being out entirely. A couple of things need to be disconnected in here, but it's just, uh, like I said, frustrating. Yeah, wiring is a real mess on these. It's very intimidating, but stay organized and keep track of what you're doing, and you should be all right in the end. And if all else fails, you can always buy a wiring diagram on eBay, which is a really cool laminated one. I've, I managed to find one for like 20 bucks. Impressive or intimidating? Maybe a little bit of both. So, this works out, I think. And then, I'm gonna confirm with her tomorrow, but one of, in one of the videos, the guy said, if you can get two people to do it with you, it'll be free. Okay, six hours, engine's out. Everything's out of the firewall. Most of the interior, just the seats are left. I was going to keep the steering wheel, but we don't really need that. I mean, keep it in. i got to get the gas pedal stone and the remaining wire that goes to the back. All the sound deadening. Not so much that stuff. And that should be it. This car's ready to go. Oh, the back glass as well. And a couple of things underneath. i got to get the sway bar out of here. 
Um, the suspension, I've got my powder coated axle there, so I don't need to worry about this. And I gotta pull my brake lines out, as well as the miscellaneous control arms and things that I'm not gonna be using as a rolling chassis. Well, thanks for watching. I hope this was very educational. I'll be seeing you in a few days with another update. Next time you see this car, she will be sandblasted and ready to go for paint. This is a joint restoration, so we're going to be pulling apart everything on Bruce in a few days. And next time you see Genevieve, she will be sandblasted, heading over to paint to get an estimate for the bodywork that will be required. Both cars are going to be mostly original, with the exception of both having B20s, overdrive transmissions. So it's going to be pretty good overall and I'm really excited. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. There's that little icon in the corner that's like a bell. Click on that. You'll get updated every time I release a new video so you don't miss anything. This is going to be a great series. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.